How's it going? Hello. So I just wanted to say one thing. Are you, are you a Muslim? Yes, I'm Muslim. Welcome to the panel. So I see your life sometimes. You talk about Muhammad did this. You bring up the hadiths. But the problem here is that you're basing everything on Western ideologies. Okay. You know, you're saying this Muhammad, he, he did this to so his wife, he struck his wife, he did this. But this, they are the ideologies from the Kufar, you know? Hmm. Do you think, do you think that these Western ideologies that I'm using are good ideologies? Like, do you think it's good to not hit your wife for a man not to hit his wife? You think that's a good virtue? So I believe what is good is decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not decided by, especially not the kufar. They do not decide what is good and what is bad. What is, what is so kufar? What is Prophet the... Muhammad, if our Prophet does something, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he does it, uh -huh. and there's tafsirs on it, scholars agree on it, mm -hmm. then we as Muslims, we have nothing to say. We have nothing to say. Okay. That, okay, I guess that answers the question. So basically, um, this Western ideology that I have that a man should never hit his wife because she is a weaker vessel, she's he's stronger physically, and he's meant to protect her and provide for her and love her like he loves his own self. You're saying that that is a, a ideology of a disbeliever and it's not a good ideology, just to be clear. No, what I'm saying is that it's not like the Quran is not saying, you know, the husband can just hit his wife. There are rules. You have to follow. Um, there are steps, you know. You know, it's saying that if, in case of you know disobedience or something like that, if you fear, you know? if you fear disobedience, yes, yes, yes. So this, she doesn't even have to commit an act of disobedience. It's if you fear it, he, he's able to do what he. And another wants. another problem is that you know when you ask too much questions, you know, why is Allah doing this? Why is it like this? You know, as a Muslim, you can fall into you know, doubts and Good. you can start questioning why Allah is doing something. Good. And, you know, Allah knows better than we do. He created us. So... I don't think so. I think... Muslims, you don't, you don't question what Allah does. That's so, just simple. Well, that's... In, simple. It's, what you just said is important. What you just said is very, very important. The second that you begin to question these commands or permissibilities and actions of Allah, then that gives room for you to now doubt Allah and Islam. And you shouldn't be doing that, is what you're saying. What you said is extremely important, which is why I say that this is, that's cult mentality, for you to not question Allah and these commands and these verses and hadith and the actions of Muhammad, because it'll cause you to start doubting. Here's my thing. I think that even you as a Muslim, that you are better than Muhammad and Allah, that you have better values. I can I think I can prove that to you. Okay, so I, I will say that is incorrect because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the best man to walk on the earth. He is the best example we follow. So me as a Muslim, um, I commit many sins. You know, he is the best to have walk, walk this earth. So Muhammad no committed, Muhammad committed many sins too. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad committed many sins too. Did you know that? But at the end of the day, he is the best example, the best man to walk the earth. So I mm -hmm. cannot, as for him, as a messenger of Allah, mm -hmm. Allah has chosen him. I cannot compare myself to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That, that's just... Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Final. Let me ask you this. Is a um, <clears throat> is a person who sins, is a person who is sin who sins a better example than one who does not sin? So this is this is exactly what my point was earlier. The point was now you're asking many questions, and the problem is that we stray further from Allah and what He has decided. We start to question what Allah like some is. Um, his decisions why so why would allah choose 
the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, if he wasn't uh, going to be a good example, you know. So in if we we can see this as Prophet and uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala, he already knows what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do. He would do. He already knows it, you know. So. You know, we as Muslims, obviously, we believe that uh, Allah, He knows everything. He's the one who created us, you know? Yeah, but I didn't ask that. So it's it's okay to ask questions, sister. It's okay to ask no, no. critical it's thinking questions. Okay. If you are going to question Allah's decisions, then it's, you are on, on dangerous ground. Well, well see, this, man, this is, this is you, man, I, I am glad that you came up because this is bringing a, this is giving good light on, Muslim, you know, ideology, you know, unreal Muslim ideology. You're not supposed to critically think. You're not supposed to um, ask critical questions or and, and deduce things and things that in Islam. You're, you're not supposed to do that. When I asked you this basic question, you're right, of who do you think is a better example, one who sins or one who does not sin? You're even saying that that's a dangerous question because it can lead you to doubting Allah. That's deep. Yes, yes that's true. That's let me true. let me let me share with you something. With the, the, so I know you may not believe because you know you're Muslim. You may not believe in the previous scriptures, um, but in in the previous scriptures, the prophet Isaiah, God reasoning with Israel, he tells Israel to come. He says, let us reason together. This is God talking, saying, come, let us reason together. He invites the people of Israel to reason with him, you know, to critically think with him because God is confident enough to reason with his people to know that the conclusion is that he is the best option and that he knows what's best for them. And he can reason with them to come to that conclusion too. But in Islam, it's the opposite. You're not supposed to reason with Allah. You can't because then you start doubting. I'm thinking, how can you reason with the one who created you? The one who already knows everything. Everything. He knows everything. He knows more than what you do. And he knows more than what your brain is capable of knowing. You know, just answer that. How is it possible? How can you question decisions that God's make he knows everything everything that you don't know more than you know well well it's 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 like this because God gave us a a mind for a reason and our mind reflects him this this uh this 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 uh aspect of reason that we have and questioning you know it, it it's reflective of God he has given us this mind to inquire to be creative to deduce and think, you know what I'm saying? It's a reflection of him. So that's why we're able, he allows us to think when it comes to him and, you know, question in sincerity, not question as in we're putting God on, you know, on the hot seat and we're the judges, not in that way. You know, we don't, we don't question God in that way, but it's just far as, you know, just questioning or having questions about his commands or her, what what he wants from us and his desires and his purpose and these are this that's okay he he invite the true god invites that only a false god would not want you to question or reason with him only a false god who's afraid of you doubting and using your brain to where you're now coming outside of the darkness and coming outside of that box only a false god a false god will give this ideology that you're not supposed to think or question in that way. But that that is what faith is. Faith is believing something that is, there's no, you know, there's no evidence, you know, from the Kufars, there's no evidence in that way. But we have faith, we believe. Even though we haven't seen it with our own eyes, we we know that there's been a prophet, that he has, he has delivered his message, and we, we believe in that message. This is something, this is faith. You well, know? Well, that's we have we have two different definitions of what faith is. What you just described is blind faith. The Bible actually says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the book of Hebrews. 
So how the Bible defines faith is that faith has substance to it. Faith has evidence to it, even though you haven't seen the particular thing yet, but there's evidence, right? And, and substance to why you should trust. So faith is trusting in the evidence that you have in the result that you haven't seen yet. That's what faith is. Blind faith is just believing blindly, you know, with no evidence, no substance. That's what you described as blind faith. The Bible doesn't say that's what faith is. The Bible says faith is based on evidence. But the thing is, there's there's many things, you know, in even in Islam that we don't know. We say Allah A'lam, God knows best. Mm -hmm. The things we that, that are not answered. Yeah. So we don't know if it's true or, or we don't know, you know, the why it is, you know. So we trust Allah, we say God knows best and we don't dive deeper, we don't start questioning that. So we we, we base everything on um, tafsir, what the scholars have provided for us, um, and faith. Yeah, so Basically. yeah, but there's there's an issue here. Yes, there are instances, right, where God knows best. There's instances where we we can't lean on our own understanding, like we're limited. So we gotta just give it up to God. God knows he, his ways are not like ours and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't eliminate the ability to question things at all. You have to be able to reason with your faith. You have to be able to reason with your worldview. You as a Muslim, you have to have a reason why you're, you're saying the, the Quran is true, why Islam is true. You can't just say, Allahu Alam, I just accept Islam, that's it. I believe it's from God, boom, 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 that's it. You have to have a reason for your faith. Even, even the Bible says this too. Notice how what, what you're saying, and like that's in Islam, in Christianity, it's completely different. In Christianity, it says to be able to give a reason for your faith when asked. Give a reason. Be able to defend your faith, right? You're supposed to be able to do that in the truth. Only in a lie would it not want you to critically think, to give an answer, to reason. Only in a cult, in a lie, does it profess such ideologies. If you can't simply reason with me, you know, as just us human beings on who, what is a better example to follow, a sinner or a non-sinner? If you can't reason with me on something as basic and simple as that, that's a problem. The thing is that at the end of the day, we Muslims, we believe what has been presented, you know, to us, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his message in the Quran, the Holy Quran, that he, the revelation he got, that is what we believe. And the Quran is indestructible. The Quran, there's nothing that can be, no, no human can produce anything like the Quran, not even one single verse. That is what is in the, in, that's what the Quran says. No I, human can, right. can, do, can do what the Quran did. I like it's that. It's a unique book. It's uh, a unique book. Now, now, do you see what you're doing? Now what you're doing is now you're giving me arguments for Islam. You're saying this book is beautiful. It's from God. This is why. Because no, 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 no. it's that's, that's not true. Well, that's, that's what you just true. did. You made some claims no. about what makes the Quran unique and true. No, that's that's not that's not my claim. The Quran says that. Okay, good. The, the Quran says that it says, let them try, let them try to do to produce a single ayah, right? A single verse, yeah. That is that is let them try to do that, and they right. can't. Impossible. Right. The it, Quran says that, uh, right? Exactly. So it's not you that's doing this, you're just quoting the Quran. And so the Quran gives us a challenge. The Quran says, even try it. There's not no jinn or anything in all of creation that can produce even a verse like it. That's the challenge of the Quran. That's it's giving an argument of why the Quran is true and how you know it's from God, because can't nobody replicate it, not even a single verse. You know what I'm saying? So this is what I would ask you, sister. If then you were to find out that someone was able to make a verse like it, even a single verse, that would then prove the Quran false, right? Because the Quran says that's impossible. So if someone was able to do that, then that would prove the Quran false, right? Well, 
What do you mean? Can you repeat the question? Yes. So the Quran gives a challenge. It says, produce something like it, even a verse. You can't produce a single ayah like it. No, nothing in creation can produce anything, not even a single verse like the Quran. And this is how you know, this is one of the things, one of the reasons how you know the Quran is unique and from God, right? That's what the Quran says. That's an argument from the Quran itself, right? All right. So now the Quran laid that out. So if then we were to find, if someone actually did make verses like the Quran, even a single verse, then that would prove that the Quran is false because it said that no one can do that. So if someone can do that, then that would prove that the Quran is false then, right? For making that challenge. Yes, if you're using that logic, yes, it would, it would be true. Beautiful. But no one can't. So that's the other argument. No okay, one can't. exactly. Possible. I got you. So this is what I want to show you, sis. I want to show you that this actually happened. And I want you to show you that this happened within Islam. Umar, are you familiar with Umar? Yes, you're talking to Umar ibn Khattab. That's yes. right, Umar ibn Khattab. He actually came up with three verses that were like the Quran. In fact, they were so much like the Quran that they actually became verses of the Quran. Let me show you this. So if we go to Umar bin Khattab, we go to how Umar came up with three verses that were so good that they even made it into the Quran. So this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, 4483. Let me pull this up really quick so that you can see it. Sahih al-Bukhari, 4483. Sahih al-Bukhari, 4483. All right. Almost there, almost there. Whoops. Oh. What the heck? I'm tripping. Four, four, eight, three, yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, so it says this. And I'll turn the camera around so you can see it, okay? I want you to be able to see the hadith yourself. Okay. You see it? Sahih al-Bukhari, 4483. It says, Umar said... I agreed with Allah in three things, or said, my Lord agreed with me in three things. I said, O oh Allah's messenger, would that you took the station, sorry, uh, uh, do, 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 do. took the station of Abraham as a place of prayer, All right? And then that verse was revealed. I also said, O oh Allah's messenger, good and bad persons visit you. Would that you ordered the mothers of the believers to cover themselves with veils. So the divine verses of Al-Hijab were revealed. I came to know that the prophet had blamed some of the, his wives. So I entered upon them and said, you should either stop troubling the prophet or else Allah will give his apostle better wives than you. When I came to one of his one of his wives, she said to Umar, Oh Umar, does Allah's messenger have what he could advise his wives with that you try to advise them? Thereupon Allah revealed, it may be if he divorced you, his Lord 
will give him instead of you wives better than you Muslims. Chapter 66, verse 5. That's literally what Umar said. So Umar was able to come up, was able to say three things that were so good that they even became Quran verses. So that means that the, the challenge has been met. Oops. And the Quran is false. Yeah, this is the Quran after Umar said what he said. So the Quran verse comes after Omar already said it, said exactly what he said. So Omar said here, he said, um, you should either stop or else Allah will give his apostle better wives than you. And then it says thereupon, the verse Allah revealed the same thing exactly what Umar said. So Omar, either Omar is also a prophet and Allah is revealing, is revealing, you know, verses to Umar as well, uh, which would also mean that the Quran is false because now that's a prophet after Muhammad. And I don't think you would say that. Or this is all a hoax and Umar and uh, Muhammad is just copying what Umar said. You know? So are you, you saying that Omar wrote that verse? Or I'm just... saying that I'm saying that Omar came up Omar came up with this verse first. He's the one who said it. And then Muhammad said that, oh yes, Allah revealed this to me as well, basically. After Umar said it. So remember the, the challenge is. Uh, create a verse like it, even a single ayah, bring something like it. Well, Umar did it three times. He brought something like the Quran three times. It was so much like the Quran that they even made it into the Quran. What he said, what Umar said, made it into the Quran. So what is the, the greatest uh, of the Sadiq? It's Sahih. It's, it's Sahih Abukari. Right here. That's the uh, you know Al Bukhari is the you know the the greatest collection of hadith books. Um, then after him, after this, it goes Sahih Muslim. That's next. So yeah. Yeah, I don't have an answer to this. I don't know. Um, that's fair enough. Maybe that the seer, that the seer explains. Or just give me one second as I set this back up. But you know, I'll just I'm just saying this, sister, and you don't have to give an answer like right now or anything like that. I'm just saying that um, when we begin to critically think about the challenges that the Quran sets up for us, right? And we see and we go into this and dive into it, you were right that when we begin to challenge the Quran or think critically, we're gonna, you're going to see that it's not, it's, it's not true. It's false. By, even by the Quran's own standards, the Quran gives a challenge and says, this is how you know the Quran is true. This is how you know it's from God because nobody can make a, something like it. This is how you know it's from God. Well, we just saw someone within Islam did made three verses like the Quran, that it even made it into the Quran. So by the Quran's own standards, the Quran is false. You know? It's just, that's just what it is. Um, now- I mean, I, I, see your, I see your logic, you mm -hmm. know. Thank um, you. But I don't know. 
It's okay. You don't have to. You don't have to give a a, a, a say on this. Um, you know, you could look into it a little deeper and, you know, see what an imam says. Um, but this is what I always encourage when I talk to Muslims who are, you know, as open as you and want to do the research. To when you get these answers from these people, make sure you're thinking about their answer, about their response, and make sure it actually lines up with the evidence that you have. Because they can just give a response and it'd be full of crap. They'd be lying or just it's not adequate. It doesn't match. Okay. Just because someone gives a response, even if it's from someone you respect, doesn't mean that the response is adequate. Okay. Um, so that's, I just want you to be careful when you do. And let's say you do research and you want to go and, and ask people and stuff like that. Make sure they're being honest to the text. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, but the thing is, sometimes I see, you know, a lot of lives like this and they pull up hadiths and the hadiths, you know, from the outside, you know, looking in, they might look very, like, uh, ridiculous. Um, but, you know, as Muslims, it's like we cannot be like, oh, this is this is false. This is ridiculous. You even if you think that you can't you can't say that, you know, hmm. so. There was there was an example um, of a had in one hadith where the there was I think it was a hadith about Moses. It was a stone something. Uh, it was a stone who, who stole his clothes or something. Yeah. And you know, at first uh, thought that is very like ridiculous. Like, why are you beating up a stone? You know. So. Yeah. But it's like as Muslims, you gotta like suppress those thoughts. It's like you can't think. No. 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 As a Muslim, you do not, oh, did you guys hear what she just said? She said, as a Muslim, you got to suppress those thoughts. No, you let those thoughts rise. You think, you know, it's ridiculous. So don't, don't suppress it. Challenge it. Let it, if, if Allah is true and Islam is true, then it should be able to withstand the scrutiny of your doubts. If Islam is true it should be able to withstand your critical thinking and reasoning skills. But it can't. What you have to do is suppress your thoughts, suppress your reasoning, suppress your critical thinking so that you can stay a Muslim. I say God forbid, and I invite you to a better way. Within Christ, you do not have to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You don't have to suppress it. Within Christ, you can ask these questions. You can bring your reasoning to Christ, lay it before him, and he answers you. He gives you under, the Holy Spirit gives you the understanding in the scriptures. God invites this because once you do this, once you reason with God, you question God. Once you do this from a sincere place, you fall more in love with him because he answers you. He shows you that he is true and he's faithful to answer, which is the opposite in Islam. He doesn't invite you to question. He doesn't invite you to challenge. He doesn't invite you to critically think. He invites you to suppress. What kind of, what kind of God so is that? How, yeah. No, go ahead. How do you know that you, you know, that you are invited to question and uh, challenge in, the, in Christianity, how do you know that? Because, like I said, remember the verse I brought you to before in Isaiah. Even in Israel's rebellion, God says, come, let us reason together. This is God speaking. So God invites us, even in our rebellion, to come reason with him. He even does this with Job. With Job, he's asking now, with Job, it's a little different because now he's he's challenging God because of his circumstance. He's He has bad circumstances, and so he's basically, you know, why God this, why this, why that, and all this kind of stuff. And even in Job's, with Job's attitude and how he's asking the question, God responds. He responds. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. The difference here uh, in the, in Islam is uh, God doesn't you know respond in that way. He's more um, it's more like you have to have faith, you, even if you don't get the answers of whatever you're thinking about. The the faith is the most important 
part, you know? So I think that is maybe was uh, the difference. I would say uh, that that is even incorrect. I would say that faith is not the most important part within Islam. It's actually your surrender. It's your submission. Because you can be a, a, a mu'min, right, which is believer, um, and then you guys, you could be a Muslim, which is submitter, surrender, you surrender. So being, just surrendering with no resistance, that is what is important over believing, having faith. That's literally what the Quran says. It says, do not say that you're believers, mu'mins, say that you are Muslims, surrenderers, right? So you don't surrender in the same way in the Christi in Christianity? Not, not without my mind. I surrender, I surrender my heart, mind, and soul. I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. God invites me to love him mentally, intellectually. That's literally the commandment, greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So he invites us to be emotionally connect, connected with him. Heart, have our heart, love him with all our heart. To be spiritually connected with him, love him with all our soul. And to intellectually be in love with him, love him with all our mind. That's what our God invites us to. It's a big difference. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but obviously if I... If you know everything, you know that you're doubting uh, about. If you just let it uh, come out, it's like you have nothing to stand on. It's like, okay, at that at that point, you just have to leave because everything is ridiculous. So the only thing that you have left is the faith that you're thinking. Okay, this is the Lord knows. Nah, knows this is what this is this just... this is what you have left to stand on, sister. Is you have the rock, who is the foundation of faith. The rock who is the foundation of salvation, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus says, lay all of your things down, leave these ridiculous ideologies, leave these cults, leave this state of unbelief, and come to me. And I give you a surety. I give you certainty. This is what Jesus says. Let me read you something. This is what Jesus says here in Matthew. I just, I just want to show you the difference of how our God communicates with us. Watch. This is what Jesus says. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son and, to, and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not that I might, not that I may, I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what Christ invites us to. When you look at Islam and you see the ridiculousness. When you don't suppress the truth, when you don't suppress those thoughts and you begin to critically think and you allow yourself to think intellectually, you'll see without a doubt, Islam is false. This stuff is ridiculous. I can't possibly believe this. So what do you do now? You come to the truth, which is Christ. And Jesus is saying that he's, he wants to reveal himself to you. Okay, so then my question would be, why is, you know, why is Christ the truth? <laughs> Very good question. Why is Christ the truth? Let me show you what. And Jesus says this right here. If we go to John. John chapter 14. Let me show you this. This is what Jesus says in John chapter 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, 
what I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He says, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas, one of his apostles, he said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said, have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So the reason why Jesus is the truth is because he himself claims and has proven to us that he is the one who has revealed the very nature and essence of God. He is the one who is the express image of the invisible God. And he has made himself known to us. And he promises us that if we believe in him, if we come to him with our heart, with our mind and our soul, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, if we come to him, he will take us to himself. He prepares a home for us in his father's house. That's why he's the truth. And there's no other way outside of him. Let me, let me show you what convinced me of this. Let me just show you what convinced me. I think that this will, you might have, I think you'll appreciate this. Usually people do. I'm going to read you something. And you tell me who this is about, okay? I promise you, you're going to get it. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the sins of us all. Sister Ann, who does that sound like to you? Jesus. I think Jesus, yes. Yep. Sounds exactly like Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting about this. I'm not reading the gospel. I'm not reading anything in the New Testament. I'm reading the book of Isaiah. This is the book Isaiah, book of Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. And in chapter 53 of Isaiah, this is 700 years before Jesus is born. 700 years before Jesus is born, prophet Isaiah speaks of the Messiah, about how he will be pierced for our sins, carry our sorrows, and how the Lord will put all of our sins upon him and by his wounds will be healed. 700 years before, God revealed that this would happen to the Messiah. That's how I know this is the truth. But then, you know, Islam, they, we, we think that um, that was not Jesus. God already they took him up to the, you know, he already, it was someone else that died hey. on, the, on the cross. Uh -huh. It was not Jesus. Now, now, now watch this. Let me, let me ask you if this, is, if this is good here. You have <clears throat> Prophet Isaiah who says that the Messiah is going to be pierced and die for our sins, right? You also have, let's go to the Zabur, the Psalms, because the Quran says that the Psalms is from God, right? Let's go to the Psalms really quick. I'm going to read you another passage. You tell me what it sounds like. This is Psalm 22, sister. It says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a post herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. 
you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my, my clothing, they cast lots. Who does that sound like, sister? Jesus. Yep. So we have Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, speaking of Jesus, talking about him being pierced, him dying for our sins and things of this nature. And you also have prophet David, Dawood, in the Zabur, in the Psalms, prophesying about the Messiah, saying that he will be pierced, having his hands and his feet pierced, being surrounded by his enemies, mocked and ridiculed. That's two. Let me show you another one. We have here. Let's go to the Torah, Moses. To the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, the very first book of the Torah. Watch this. Starting at verse 14. Then God said to the serpent. So God is speaking to the serpent after he deceived Adam and Eve into eating the fruit. This is what, this is what he says here. God cursing the serpent. He says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go of the, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Verse 15. This is the key part. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Talking to the serpent, Satan. Between you and the woman, I will put enmity. Between your seed and her seed. Her offspring. You shall bruise your head. You, he, he shall bruise your head while you shall bruise his heel. So the seed of the woman, not of man, but the seed or the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head while Satan will also bruise the seed of the woman's heel. Let me ask you, who is the offspring of the woman? Jesus. Exactly. Son of Mary, right? Born of the Virgin. Not a son of Adam, but the son of Mary. So Jesus is prophesied here and it says that he will crush the serpent's head while at the same time the serpent will bruise him as well he will be getting bruised in the process so we have moses in the torah who says that the messiah the virgin born son will be bruised we have david in the zabur who says that the messiah will be pierced will be crucified laid in the dust of death we have Isaiah 53, who says that the Messiah will be pierced, wounded for our transgressions, carrying our sins, and by his stripes, his wounds, it brings us healing. He takes on the punishment for ourselves. Let me show you one more. Let me show you one more. There's plenty. And then I'll bring you to the point that I'm showing you. Okay? We got Zechariah. <clears throat> Chapter 12. Oops. Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. I'm doing this for a reason. I'm giving you these different prophets for a reason. Watch. So this is God speaking. He says this. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, we've been seeing a theme here. Who, according to all the scriptures that we've been seeing, is the one that's pierced? Sister, who is that? Yes, it sounds like, it sounds like Jesus. It's Jesus. So it's Jesus who they've pierced. And when they finally see him, that day when he comes, they will see him, the one whom they pierced, and they will cry. They will feel guilty. They will feel remorseful because they're realizing what they've done. But it's going to be too late. 
So we got Zechariah says that the Messiah is pierced, bruised for us. We have the Torah, Moses, who says that the Messiah is bruised for us. We have the Zabur, Psalms, who says that the Messiah is crucified, has his hands and feet pierced, mocked and ridiculed by his enemies for us. You got Isaiah 53, who says that the Messiah bears our sins, our sorrows, and is pierced and bruised for us. Now, let me ask you this. When you have all of the scriptures, all of the scriptures, all agreeing with the same thing. Hold on. Let me get you Jesus now. Let me just finish it off with Jesus. Last one. This is what Jesus says. In Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 46, this is what he says here. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me, this is what Jesus is saying, everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So the prophets, the Psalms, the Torah, the law of Moses, and the gospel, Jesus himself, all of them say the same thing, that the Messiah would suffer for our sake, die for our sins, for our sake, and then also live again. So who should I take? If I'm being critically, if I'm thinking critically and being honest, who should I take, Sister N? Should I line up with, or go with all the prophets who over generations and generations apart from each other, some 700 years, some 1,000, some 500, some 300 years apart, all for some reason have the same revelation about the Messiah. And then we finally get to Jesus who says, yes, this is about me. I have fulfilled this, that the Messiah should suffer. Should I go with them who all agree and have the same revelation, the same thread? Or should I go with the Quran that comes 600 years after Jesus and then contradicts what we just read, what all the prophets of the past said over and over and over again? Who should I go with? I would say you should go with uh, whatever everyone else said, the prophet said and stuff like that. Boom. And that is why, sister, you should leave Islam today and come to the truth of the Messiah. Because the one problem here is that the, the Islam says the it can't be trusted. The the, the scriptures the it can't be trusted. It's been corrupted. Nope, that's that's, what Islam says. That's not what the Quran says, though. The Quran says that the scriptures are actually intact and that I should actually judge by my scriptures. Let me show you. If you go to chapter 5, verse 43 of the Quran, watch this. This, this is silly for Muslims, not, not you, uh, other Muslims that come up with this argument. It's silly for them to try to say, oh, the scriptures have been corrupted according to the Quran. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. Let me show you this. In chapter 2, verse 41, we'll start here. Chapter 2, verse 41. But then again, it would be interesting that the scriptures have all been corrupted to say the same thing <laughs> over 700 years, 1,000 years, 500 years, 300 years apart from each other, that they all say the same thing. That'll be interesting. <laughs> what a conspiracy theory. But this is what the Quran says. Chapter 2, verse 41. Chapter 2, verse 41. It says this. Believe in what I have sent down, the Quran, confirming that which is with you, the Torah and the gospel, and be not the first to disbelieve therein. 
and buy not my verses with a small price. And fear me and fear me alone. The Quran says that the Quran came confirming the Torah and the gospel, that it's true. And it's the Torah and the gospel that they have in their hands. They have it with them. It's not corrupted. Let's keep going. Go ahead. You have something to say? No, it's true because sometimes I see, I see, I've seen letters, and then some places I see it has, they say it has been corrupted with the the people's the people's you know the writing and stuff like that. So I don't know <clears throat> which is. So so either so either we have a contradiction with the Quran in this that it's saying that the scriptures that they have is true, while in another place it's saying that the scriptures that they have are corrupted. That would be a contradiction. Now, me as a Christian reading this, I'm going to be honest to the text. The Quran doesn't say that. The Quran doesn't say that the text of the scriptures is corrupted. Over and over and over and over and over again, the Quran says that the scriptures are true, that they what they have, that it's authentic, that they should judge by it, live by it, recite it correctly, and things of this nature. Okay. So who has who who's saying that it's corrupted? Because every time the I Muslim. hear, you know, Muslims say it's corrupted, corrupted. Where is it coming from? Just, I don't... It's coming from their teachers. They have to say that they have to look. They have to say that the scriptures are corrupted because when you go into the scriptures, you see that the Quran contradicts the scriptures. So they have to say, oh well, these they it must something must have went wrong. They must have been corrupted. They have to say that in order to try to save face. But in doing that, they're going against what the Quran says. They're showing, if, by saying that the, that, the, that the scriptures have been corrupted, they're saying that Allah was one, unfaithful and unable to preserve his scriptures. Two, that he's deceitful because he's saying that he's confirming what is with the Jews and the Christians? So is he confirming corrupted scripture? Would Allah do that? Would he, cor would he confirm corrupted scripture? Does he not know that they're already corrupted? Why would he tell them that the Quran is confirming corrupted text? Or to, for them to follow corrupted text? So it brings a lot of problems. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um... Now, it, it, but it gets worse though. So let me let me show you where there, there, there's these verses that that that, that they they uh, they come up with. So same chapter. So notice I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the consistent theme in chapter two, okay? And then I'm going to show you the verse in chapter two that they try to use, and you and 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 then we'll be the judge, okay? So I just showed you one verse, chapter two, verse forty-one, right, where it says that the Quran is confirming what is with them. That what they have with them, the Torah and the gospel, is true. And it and the Quran lines up with it. Okay? So, <clears throat> it then it goes on to say this. Verse 42. And mix not truth with falsehood, nor conceal the truth. All right? Nor conceal the truth. While you know. Okay? So, they have the truth. So, don't hide it. Don't run from it. Let's go to the relevant one. All right, here it is. Enjoin you uh, piety and righteousness and obedience to Allah on the people and forget, and, and you forget yourselves while you recite the scripture. Have you then no sense? So the Quran is saying, that they're basically forgetting to be righteous and do good deeds and stuff like that, right? Forgetting to be pious, while at the same time, they are reciting the scripture. And he's like, that doesn't make any sense. You guys are being hypocrites. So they're reciting the scripture. Wait, are they reciting corrupted scripture? No, they're not. <laughs> they're reciting the scripture that the Quran says is there with them, that it confirms. So they have the scripture. And they're also reciting the scripture. Let's keep going. Let's keep going with chapter two. Let's go to two verse eighty nine. Here it is again. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick in one chapter to show you the common theme. 
Verse 89 of chapter 2. It says this. And when there came to them a book from Allah confirming what is with them. Hear that again? Confirming what is with them. Although before they had invoked Allah in order to gain victory over those who disbelieved. Then when there came to them that which they had not recognized, which that which they had recognized, they disbelieved in it. So let Allah's curse be upon them. So again, we have that the Quran came confirming what is with them. So it says they have the Torah and gospel. It confirms the Torah and gospel. They have it. It's not corrupted. It's saying that it's true. Here we go. Verse 91 again. Same chapter, just a few verses down. And when it is said to them, believe in what Allah has sent down, they say, we believe in what has in what was sent down to us. And they disbelieve in that which came after it, while it is the truth confirming what is with them. <laughs> you see in the common theme here in chapter two? Yeah, uh, it's um, pretty it's, clear, right? Uh, it's, yeah, it raises questions. Yes. Mm hmm. Now, here's verse 85. Now, verse 85 says this. Um, <clears throat> After this, talking about the Jews, it is you who unalive one another and drive out a party of you from their homes, assist their enemies against them in sin and transgression. And if they come to you as captives, you ransom them, although their expulsion was forbidden for you. Watch this. Here's the important part. Then do you believe in a part of the scripture and reject the rest? Then what is the re recompense of those who do so among you except disgrace in this life and on the day of resurrection? They shall be consigned to the most grievous torment. So now the Quran is addressing those who pick and choose parts of the scripture that they want to believe in and the other parts of the scripture that they reject, like the Muslims do. You'll have Muslims that say, and you probably heard this, well, we don't say that all of the Bible is corrupt. We believe in that there's some truth left in it. And we believe that there's some parts that's corrupted, some parts there's still nuggets of truth. The Quran condemns such people that do that. It says, do you then believe in part of the scripture while rejecting the rest? Whoever does that, the Quran says, is disgraced in this life and in the next life. The Quran says, don't do that. All right? Now, let's go yeah, to some, the... Some uh, people, some Muslims are saying I should live the life. Of course they are. Because... Of course they are. Because you're thinking. And because we're getting truth and having a good conversation. They, this is what Satan does. When you're in the midst of truth... When you're thinking and your heart is being turned and convicted, Satan wants to distract and wants you to leave. And I bet you your messages are going to be loaded. Your DMs are going to be loaded with messages from Muslims that are saying, oh, come, come get, you know, don't go back. Don't listen to him. He's like, all this kind of stuff. It's going to be loaded with a lot of that stuff. But I'm praying for your protection. I'm praying that, you know, that God protects you from the vices of Satan, from the lies and deceit of the people. And that you, he brings you into his truth and he protects you. That's what I hope for you. That's my prayer. And Christians, everybody, YouTube and, and on TikTok, you guys should be praying for this sister and praying for this conversation because this is spiritual warfare. There's people that want to distract and take her away. But here's what Jesus says. That my sheep, what does he say? My sheep hear my voice. John chapter 10. He says, and I give them eternal life. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. That's what Jesus says. You hear his voice. You are his sheep. And there's not a single person that can snatch you out of his hand. Nobody. So we're going to keep going and we're going to keep talking about this truth.
Well, this is in Islam. Is the Allah says that we are His slaves. So mm. you know, our mission is to serve uh, Allah, and you know, we are we're the, we're the slave of Allah. So that is the the that is like how we how it's viewed. You know, so yeah, I, it's I kind of different. I understand. Yes, it's very different. In fact, this this is what the Bible says here. <clears throat> the Bible gives you a different relationship that you can have with God. In Islam, you're just a slave of Allah, nothing more. You're just his servant. In the gospel, the gospel reveals this about God to us. It says this. It says... But to all, let me just read, let me start up. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now here it is. But to all who did receive him, Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become not slaves, but children of God, who are born not by blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So in Christ Jesus, in the Messiah, you're not just a slave of God, you're not just a servant of God, but you become a daughter of God. I am a son of God. That is the intimate relationship that God allows me to have with him when I come into belief. Infinitely more significant than the relationship that's presented in Islam. You're just a slave. You're just a slave. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, you know, you can't question it. So it's like... Uh, you can, though. That's what we're doing. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't uh, question. Oh, but you can, though, In You can, and you're doing it now. You can, and you're doing it now. You know? Um, you can question it, and you see that when you question it, you see, you, you see the problems, right? You see, you see the problems. You see the differences. Watch this. This is what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now, the slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see that? You see the difference that Jesus makes between a slave and a son? The slave does not is not in the, the house of the, of the master forever, but the son is an eternal resident of the house. That's what God says about you, is that you are in his house. You come to believe in him, you believe in the Messiah, you are a daughter of God, and you remain in his house forever. Remember what I showed you earlier, that he, in his father's house, is many mansions. All you got to do is believe in him, and he will take you to himself. This is what he says. You will have this as an inheritance forever. In Islam, it's not the same. You're just a slave. Well, the slave it does it does sound, um, you know, degrading. But it's like I can't think that way. So <laughs> it's just you have to go with it, even if it doesn't sound uh, the way that uh, you would, uh, you know, the relationship that you would think with, you know, you have with God. So yeah, it's it's, it's a difficult. So sister, with, with with all that we've shown. We, we, we've shown literally the, the contrast between Allah and Muhammad and between Jesus. What the prophets have taught all throughout the gospel and then what Muhammad comes with his contradictions of the prophets. And we see, here's the Achilles heel of Islam. The Achilles heel is that Islam, in the Quran says, that my scriptures are true. That's the Achilles heel. It says that my scriptures are true. Matter of fact, 
This is what it says for me to do as a Christian. For me as a Christian, this is what I'm supposed to do. Chapter 5, verse 47. It says this, and I quote, Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed in it. Whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, such are the wrongdoers. So I am supposed to judge by my gospel. Now, when I judge by my gospel, and I look at Islam and I look at the Quran and I see how Islam contradicts the gospel. It contradicts Jesus. It contradicts the prophets. And I judge by the gospel. I have to judge that Islam is false. So the problem here is that the, that the, the previous the scriptures even though, like, as you showed with the with the Quran, like, it seems like it's true. So the relationship between those scriptures um, is kind of, it's not really, one is saying something and the other one is saying something else. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like you can't really know what's true. You can, though. Remember I told you, we we know what's true. Remember what we, we said it together. We know what's true when there is consistency, right? When you have all the way from the beginning in Genesis, Moses in the Torah, agreeing with David in the Psalms, agreeing with prophet Isaiah, agreeing with prophet Daniel, agreeing with prophet Zechariah, and agreeing finally with Jesus, the gospel, we see that there's a common thread, a consistency. And the only odd man out is the Quran that disagrees with them all. While yes, at the that same, is true. Hmm? that is true. Right. So for me, what I'm thinking is, um, obviously, I do believe in the scriptures, the the previous scriptures. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, as you said, there's a there's a Quran who says something else. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to piece together is, you know, what happened. Um, what happened in the way, you know, like from when Muhammad received his um, his revelation. I'll tell you what happened. From the angel Gabriel. Oh, I'll tell you what happened, sister. You are asking such. <laughs> you see what happens when you think and you allow yourself to think and these conclusions are coming? Oh, my gosh. This, uh, let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened. And the Bible literally warns us already. 600 years before, about this very thing. This is what the book of Galatians says. <clears throat> it says this. I am astonished, verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6 of Galatians. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, verse 8, watch this. But even if we, this is an apostle speaking, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we, we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary than the one you received, let him be accursed. So you see here, the Bible has already warned us that there's people and there will be people in the future. Mom is not the only one. There's a guy named Joseph Smith. There's Ellen G. White. And there's a bunch of false prophets out there. There's people that are coming with a different message that is inconsistent with the one that we have already received from the prophets. 
We have a consistent message, and then there's people that will come that will contradict it, that preach a gospel contrary to it, a message different and contrary to it, and even claim that an angel from heaven came and gave them this revelation. The Bible even warns us, even if it was an angel that came and gave a revelation that's different from what you have already received, gave a gospel that's different from what you received, let them be accursed. They're falsehoods. They're false, false prophets, false teachers. It's a false revelation. The Bible warns us about this already. Yeah, so, yeah, I see how it's a, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I have been thinking about, um, one question, I even brought this to um, a sheikh. I asked this, but the, the answer wasn't really, it wasn't really answered. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering if anyone saw you know, the prophet received the revelation <laughs> because he was in a cave. Yeah. Um, alone. It was a, you know, a private uh, mm -hmm. interaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but, you know, afterwards he came to uh, his uh, wife and he, he told her about the revelation, but no one, you know, saw the actual interaction. Exactly. No one. So that's something. Yeah. There's, there's no witnesses to uh, Muhammad's interaction in the cave. There's no witnesses. As a matter of fact, here's what's interesting. Uh, you know how supposedly it's supposed to be the angel Gabriel? Well, that spirit or whatever that entity was that came to Muhammad in the cave never, never made himself known as Gabriel. Never. Never, ever. But here's what's interesting. Again, on top of that, Whenever we look at, so it was Warica that had to tell Muhammad, it was Warica that told Muhammad, oh, don't worry, that's, that's the angel Gabriel who, who appeared to the prophets. Now remember, our common thing, how do we know something is true? With consistency, if it's consistent with the prophets. Whenever we look at, whenever Gabriel appears in the previous scriptures, he always makes himself known. He says, be not afraid. I'm Gabriel. I come from the Lord. I come to, with a message from the Lord. Always. Always says, fear not. Be not of fear. Be at peace. Here, you have this spirit, this entity, who Warica says is Gabriel, doesn't make himself known to Muhammad, doesn't say, I'm Gabriel, and doesn't calm Muhammad down, doesn't say, fear not. Don't worry. Be not afraid. He actually incites Muhammad's fear. He begins to, you know, treat him like a rag doll. You know, like he begins to, to press on him to where he can't take it anymore. Multiple times saying, read, read. Right? Muhammad said, I can't read. I can't read. And then he presses him again to where he can't take it anymore. And then again, Muhammad, he says, read, read. Right? It's so bad that Muhammad comes out of the cave. It says that his like his veins are popping. You can see his veins is beating. Like you know when you're you're afraid and your heart is beating really fast, you can even see like your pulse beating, vein pulsing. And it says that he went and I'm reading it right here. It's Sahih Al Bukhari number three. He went to Khadija and said, "Cover me, cover me." He was seeking refuge with Khadija. And it says they covered him till until his fear was over. And after that, he told her everything that had happened and said, I fear that something may happen to me. This is not biblical. You never see this with, with the prophets and, and with the experiences with Gabriel and the angels of God. Never. Now, at first, they will be startled when they see the angel, right? Because it's, it's a being they've never seen before and he's just popping out of nowhere. You're going to be startled. But they always respond with, fear not, be at peace, fear not, be not afraid, for I am Gabriel. They let them, they make themselves known, and they bring peace to the situation. You understand what I'm saying? So the, even this is inconsistent with how revelation comes to the prophets. Yeah, yeah it is uh, definitely a problem, Yeah, I think. 
um, a lot of like uh, inconsistencies as well. Yeah. Um, everything that uh, you pre presented. But to me, the biggest thing is, you know, this question that I was just thinking about because because it was a private, we, we don't, because they, they say sometimes that Muhammad uh, did perform miracles. <laughs> um, not so, but the biggest is the revelation of the Quran. That's the biggest miracle. Yeah. But um, yes, yeah, it, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, well, this is what I would say, um, because you're right. The inconsistencies are as clear as day. They the ins the inconsistencies are as clear as the chocolate on my face. It's clear, you know. There's no questions about it. And <clears throat> here's the dangerous thing. And remember, when we first started, it's amazing. When we first started, you had the mindset of where you you was not questioning. You you were not going to allow yourself to to go into these thoughts and to go deeper into this stuff. And but you have now allowed yourself to do so. And you see this stuff, you see it, sister. I, I, you see the consistency with the scripture. <laughs> you see the inconsistency with Islam, with Muhammad. And not only that, but if we were to get into other things, I'm pretty sure you would see the immorality that you try that you say that you know you just accept. You know, Allah says it, whatever. Boom, boom, boom. But you know that it's wrong. You know in your heart and your mind that you can't accept this, all right? But you try to just submit to it. You try to suppress it, like you said earlier, but you don't. When you see this stuff and you see the falsehood, the, the very thing you do is run. Get out of there and come to the truth. Come to Jesus Christ where there's consistency. Yeah. We, when we read the, you know, the, the, the Quran, the Quran, where Allah, when He is speaking in the Quran, He, you know, always emphasizes, you know, that the um the, the punishments, you know, to the, the one who rejects the Quran, the, um, the disbelievers. There's always um, reminders, you know, and often mm -hmm. it can be very like detailed, you know. Yeah. So you know, it, it is it's also coming from a sense of um, you have to like fear Allah, you know. Yeah. So I think that's <clears throat> why many don't want to question. I, I I get it. I understand it. I understand. And and that's and that's that's true. <laughs> that it, it's that that fear factor, right? It's that fear factor. Now I just wanted to go back to the verses that you said that, that I brought to you earlier that shows the difference. Notice the difference here. Besides the fear factor that is to it that is in Islam, believe in the Quran or you face judgment, believe in the Quran, da 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 da. This is what Jesus says. Remember, I read this to you before, John 14, verse 1. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. He says, believe in God. Believe also in me. That's what he says. In Christ, you have nothing to fear. In Christ, there is no reason that your heart should be troubled. That is how, that is how gentle, that is how uh, caring, and that is how intimate our Lord is with us. Come to him, he says, I will give you rest for your souls. No panic, no stress, no, none of that when it comes to your salvation, thinking of where you'll end up. Um, hoping that you may get his mercy, things of this nature, none of that. He says, let your heart, let not your hearts be troubled. Fear not. Come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke. I'll take yours. I'll take your burdens, lay it before me, and I'll give you my yoke for it's easy and light. It's easy. The, the, yeah, that's the only the problem I have here is, you know, like like you said, the, you know, what's in between the with the gospel and the Quran, like you know what happened on the way, and you know, the, the, just the fact that, you know, that the Prophet Muhammad, um, 
would have been like deceived, I don't know, something like that, because the because of that for the fact that the Quran is is contradicting itself sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that logic, does that mean the gospel is the is the true the truth? Yes, ma'am. That means that the gospel is the truth, and it's not because the Quran is false. That's not that's not why the gospel is true. The gospel is true because it is consistent and in line with what God has already revealed in the past before the gospel came into fruition, right? We saw in the Torah, we saw in Isaiah, we saw in the Psalms, we saw in Zechariah, we saw in Daniel, the gospel already being foretold before we even get the gospel, right? So the gospel is consistent. It's a fulfillment of what the prophets had already revealed through the revelation of God. That's how we know the gospel is true. Right? The Quran, not only is it inconsistent with its own self and bringing problems and contradictions within its own self, which by the Quran's own standards shows that it's not from God, because it says in chapter four, it says, if this book was not from Allah, you would find in it many inconsistencies. It literally says that. In chapter four, I think it's verse 80. Uh, I think it's 84. No, 82. 482. Yeah, 482. If this Quran is not from Allah, you would find in it many contradictions, many inconsistencies. It says it. Yep, 482. So by the Quran's own standard, we see that it's false. We saw that Umar met the challenge. We see that it has many inconsistencies. The Quran is out the window. And it's inconsistent with the previous scriptures, with the prophets. The gospel, on the other hand, is consistent with the previous, with the previous scriptures. So Yeah, I think uh, most most Muslims, you know, they you know, they see it, but maybe they are, you know, they're suppressing it because because of um they're saying that they have to have faith in Allah, that this is this is the truth. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the problem because, you know, I think every person, every person thinks that some of the things that the prophet did was not uh, good, mm-hmm. of course. So, you know, and then to hold him to, you know, a standard to say he's the most perfect human that uh, will, there's, there's like an inner conflict with, within yourself that you still have to like suppress. Yeah. Yep. So, so, you, so it's difficult. So you already know it. So then with you having the light and you, because I mean, you were, you were one of those, right? Right in this live, that was you. <laughs> right? In this live, yeah. that was yeah, that's, you. That's true. And it's not you anymore. It's not you anymore. I, I feel like you've already left Islam in your heart. That was you. What you just described was you at the beginning of this conversation. Now it's not you anymore. Somehow it sounds like the scales have fallen off your eyes and you're able to see this now. And you're able to see the condition of the Muslim. You're able to see it. Especially having the insight. The the problem is that, um, you know, that the Quran says that it is, you know, the first verse that I mentioned, the Quran is unique in its way. No one can, like you said, like no one can you know, create anything like it. But then this hadith that's saying um, Omar, he has created something or inspired, I don't know. Mm-hmm. This verse has been revealed. So yeah. that is very, very strange. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yes, it would mean, it would mean that the Quran is false. But, yep. you know, as Muslims, it's like, it's hard to say to say that because that but that means immediately you you left the, the religion basically. Yep. Yep. And that's okay because what we want to do, sis, is we want to submit to truth, right? <clears throat> we don't want to submit. Yes, of we want to submit to truth, uh, regardless of you know our attachments. 
um, what we're used to, you know, culturally, culturally and things of this nature. What matters is the truth. Even if it goes against our culture and what we've grown up, what we've grown used to, what we what would, what is normalized for us, truth is what matters. And so, yes, I understand the difficulty. Like, I, <laughs> I'm telling you, I see it. The difficulty in realizing, yeah, that would that would make this false. And what what I used to believe in, what I used to defend, and stand up for, and live my life according to, is false. And that's hard to say, but the freedom when you do say it, the freedom that you have, the freedom that Christ offers, it's incomparable to the bondage or the fear that you have to not submit to the truth. Complete, it's infinitely better. The weight off of your shoulders, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. For me, you know, when you, I've never seen the, these uh, these verses or these um, these hadiths before, mm. so for me, you know, I've always heard, you know, the 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 Bible is corrupted, the scriptures are corrupted, mm -hmm. it can't be trusted. Yep. But I, I don't know where where it came from. Yeah. That, that uh, I don't know where that came from. I haven't seen the verses in the in the Quran, so yeah. it's, it's it's kind of like you're in like a state of shock, you know? Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, <clears throat> it's it's interesting with that with that topic, you know. The Quran does talk about how there were hypocrites among the Jews and Christians who would lie about their scriptures, who would distort it with their tongues, right? Who would misinterpret it and try to hide it and stuff like that, hide its meanings. Um, there, were, like some of them, not it would say literally, not all of them. It would say some of them do this. And, and so the problem is that these Muslims would like, they will take these verses that say those type of things and try to create a narrative like, see, the Quran's saying that the Bible, the Bible's corrupted when that's not what it's saying. It's condemning certain groups of people who are distorting with their mouths and their tongues and, you know, um, trying to rely on maybe books that they wrote them on their own selves and stuff like that. But the actual Torah and gospel, the Quran is consistent. It is preserved. It's there for, it's true. We should judge by it and live by it um, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's 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 crazy. It's a shock. But sister, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I want, I, I just want so bad for you to be free. I really do. I want so bad for you to be yeah. free. You know, when, when you're on the, from, from the outside looking in, you're looking at the, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, or if you're looking at the, you know, Jesus, you know, the, I think there's there's definitely a difference. Like when you think about the mm -hmm. characters, like Jesus never married, to, you know, like a nine year old. So yep. there's definitely a differences. So you know? I, you know, what I think, I think that now we're at a part where I can I can re ask you this question, and I think that you're now at a, at a place where you can answer it now. What do you think is the better example? Following someone who was sinful or following someone who never sinned? Which one is the better example? Yeah, following someone who's not a sin, who hasn't committed sin. Exactly. Exactly. And not only in the Bible, but also in the Quran. Jesus is sinless. He never committed a sin. He was purified, pure of all sins and flaws. While Muhammad, as you see, there's problems, you know? And even the Quran says that Muhammad, you know, he had sins in the past, had sins in the future that Allah would forgive. That's chapter 48, verse 2. It says he forgives his past sins and his future sins that he'll commit in the future. The Hadith says, Muhammad says that he repented seven times, 70 times a day. So Muhammad was full of sins. <clears throat> and then we see, we even obviously look at the things that he did, the, uh, the his relationship with Aisha. Um, I think any thinking person, uh, you know, understands that that is a, a sick thing. There's no way you can justify that.
Yeah, of course. But I'm thinking if, um, if, um, if let's just say hypothetically, we establish that the, the Prophet Muhammad is a, is a false prophet. Yeah. And we look at the, you know, the the messenger before him, mm-hmm. um, meaning Jesus. Mm-hmm. Who? What? So what exactly does Jesus say about the God? So say what was that question again? Sorry. So if uh, if we you know hypothetically if we establish that uh, Muhammad is a false prophet yeah. and the and the messenger that comes before Muhammad is Jesus mm-hmm. what 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 does Jesus say about the God Ah what does he reveal about God beautiful Yeah So <clears throat> this is how Jesus this is what Jesus teaches about God Let's see here Let's go over to so number 1 Jesus teaches that God is our heavenly father, all right? He teaches that God is our heavenly father. Wow. (sighs) Who requires of us to love, to reflect his character here on earth, his love, his justice, his mercy, his character. Right, Jesus says that our Father in heaven provides for us, that he nurtures us, that just as he um, takes care of the sparrow, the bird, or dresses up the lilies, the flowers, how much more will he then care for you? If all you need to do is believe, you ask, you seek, and you knock, and the door will be open to you, he says. And our father is willing and ready with open arms to take care of his kids, of his children. So he's our heavenly father. And it's, he teaches that the heavenly father loved us so much that he sent his son into the world, his begotten son, his only son, to save the world even while the world is in sin, even while we were in rebellion. He teaches that our heavenly father was filled, is filled with so much love for us, his creation, that <clears throat> because we're sinful and because God is holy and he's just, we are stained with sin and we have to face God on judgment day, right? And Jesus teaches that God is impartial and he doesn't give just sweep sin under the rug he has to be just and holy sin cannot just go by and so he teaches that the heavenly father because of that he sends his son into the world to represent mankind to save mankind and to take on the sins of mankind himself so that we don't have to all right he says for god so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. So he teaches that God is the heavenly father, that he sent his son into the world to save the world, to redeem the world, to make the world right with him spiritually, right? And that also that he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we may walk in obedience and have help and guidance here on this earth in our Christian walk. So he teaches us this in John chapter, John chapter 14. And I want you to pay attention to how closely, how intimate God or Jesus presents God to us. <clears throat> Still in John 14, he says, this is what Jesus says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
right? So he says, in that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. You see that? Jesus says, if we hear his words and we obey his words, he will make himself known to us. But not just him, his father as well. All right. Says here, Judas, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will make yourself known to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still here, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So you see this, this what, how Jesus reveals the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit intimately, intimately bond, commune, and are relational with us. Right? He doesn't leave us alone. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm just wondering, uh, hmm. there's three different uh, entities, but there's the same God. Is that so? It's you. You have it's it's the persons is what we'll say. It's three. It's three distinct persons, right? Three distinct persons. When I say persons, meaning um, you know agents that are conscious, that have a will, have mind. You know, what I'm saying that are self-aware. Uh, it's three distinct persons and one one being, one God. So within the divine essence of God, within the divine nature of God, you have God who consists of, within his own nature, three distinct persons. So they all share in the same divine essence. All right. But they have different uh, qualities or the something? They they have they have uh, different roles. They have different roles, and um, as far as when it, like so when it comes to their qualities, they have the same they have the same qualities in their nature, right? So they're they're all because they share the same they share, they share the same essence. So they have the quality of all powerfulness. They're all they're all powerful. They're all knowing. They're um, you know omnipresent, not limited to space. Things of this nature. Because they share the same essence, they have the same qualities in that way. Now, they're distinct, though, in their roles, in their relation, in relation to one another. They're distinct, right? And in how they interact with us as well. There's the distinction. Okay. So, so Jesus could perform uh, miracles through the Father. Is that the, the right? Yes. Yeah, so Jesus performing miracles on his own? Well, so... You, this this is what the interesting thing of, of, about this, about when it comes to Jesus. So it teaches this about Jesus. It says, <clears throat> John 1. So Jesus is known as the word of God, right? It even has this, this thought in the Quran. But the Quran doesn't know what that means. In the Bible, this is what it says. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God himself. So the word is with someone who is God, right? Which is the father. And he, the word, also shares the same essence as the father because he's God himself as well, right? So that's showing the plurality within God's essence. It says he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Everything came into existence through Jesus. He was there in the beginning, all right? Then it comes down and it says in verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So we see the word who is God, 
also came down and took on flesh. So when he came down and took on flesh, this is him um, submitting himself, you know, as a servant to the father. So the works that he does, he doesn't do by himself. He doesn't do apart from the father. They're inseparable. He can't, they're, they're not separated from each other. Right. So um, this is the stuff that when it comes to Jesus saying, you know, the works that I do, I do through my father and stuff like that. The father does works through me, things of this nature. This is him speaking in the sense that he doesn't do anything by himself. He does nothing by himself, but neither does the father. The father doesn't do anything by himself either. This is what Jesus says, because whatever the father does, the son and the spirit are always included. They are, they're inseparable. So Jesus says this in John chapter five, <clears throat> he says, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, the son does nothing by himself. But what he sees the father doing, for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. So Jesus just said that he as the son can do everything that the father can do. He can do whatever the father can do and does it the same way, right? Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So everything that the father does, the son is always included. He, the father doesn't do anything by himself either. All right. So he, he gives an example. For example, he says, for as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so the son also gives life to whom he wills. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. And watch this. That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So even though Jesus comes, he takes on flesh, right? And he humbles himself. He submits himself to the will of the father and things of this nature. He makes it clear that that doesn't take away from his divinity. He still has the same qualities that the father has. He has the judgment he can raise the dead and give life to whoever he chooses, things of this nature. But in these things that he does, he never works separately from the father. They are inseparable and vice versa. The father doesn't work separately from the son. They are inseparable because they're one being, one nature. Now, when it comes to this, it's a very complex issue, right? The, the Trinity. Um, but this is what I expect because it's like, man, man can't make this up, but this is completely other than what we know in creation. You can't, we can't point to anything in creation and say, yeah, this is exactly what God is like, or this is what God is like, right? This concept that God, there's one being that is multi-personal, that has multiple persons within his essence. That concept is, is. It does, it's, you, you don't find that anywhere in creation. You don't even find that in pagan theologies. You don't find that, right? And the Bible says that there is nothing in creation that is like me. There's nothing that's like him. The Quran has the same ideology, right? That uh, there's nothing like Allah. He's completely above creation. But here's where that gets a little inconsistent with me. Because with it, in Islam, with Tawheed, you have Allah, one being who's one person. That, that's just like me. I am one being and one person. But I would expect, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised with God who's not like his creation to not be like me. Meaning he's one being who is multi-personal. That doesn't surprise me. Do I understand the, intric the intricacies of that? No. But it doesn't surprise me that that's how God revealed himself. Yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, bef before I've been thinking, um, how can how can God, you know, die on the cross? Mm -hmm. Why? Why is uh, how is that happening? Yes. Is, uh, godly. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. nature. Yeah, of course, of course. So this is this is what it is. So when it comes to Jesus, let me just read this to you. <clears throat> Remember, the word who is God took on flesh, right? Took on flesh. So he has a divine nature and a human nature. Okay. So when we say that God died on the cross for us, we're saying not that his divine nature ceases or dies. It can't. That's impossible. God can't die, right, in his divine nature. In order for him to even experience death, which is separation from body and soul, he would have to take on a human nature, a human body, a human form, right, in order to for that to even be possible. So it's not that his divine nature dies. It's that the human nature that he took on, he dies according to the flesh, not his divine nature. And so Philippians breaks this down pretty well. Philippians 2 says this. Thank you for the super chat, guys. Philippians 2 says this. <clears throat> it says, um, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's talking about humility, having a humble mindset. And it says that even Christ had this humble mindset, the most humble mindset. And then it breaks down how. How was Jesus humble? It says, Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something he had to hold on to. He didn't have to hold on to. But he made himself of no reputation by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So it says that even though he had the form of God, he humbled himself and took on the form of man as well. And so then it says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So how is it possible that Christ, who is God, who has the form of God, is able to experience death? Is that he took on a human nature and in his human form humbled himself and died according to the flesh. Okay. Does that make, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, it does answer. But the one, the one question is, so, so is it because there's laws? Because why, why didn't. Yeah. Why, so why, why is that necessary? Huh? Why is that? Why did that have to happen? Yeah. yeah excellent question. Why is, why is it then? Why is that the case? Why is it that Jesus had to die for our sins? Why, why, why can't he basically just forgive us and call it a day, basically? Why does it have to be that or something else? So yes, and you're right. It comes down to the law, the law of God. The law of God, when it comes down to sin, has a price. And the price of it is death. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the price of sin, is death. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get that verse for you. Uh, da, 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 da. What's that verse, guys? I know. Is it Romans 5? The wages of sin is death. Having a brain fart. I'm in Romans 5 right now. Oh, it's Romans 6. <laughs> I knew that. I was just, I was just checking if y'all knew that. It's Romans 6, sister Ann. All right. So Romans 6, the Bible says this. It says, it says, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the price of sin is death. And we also see this in Leviticus in the law. Why does it then? So why is death necessary? Because death is the price by which we had to pay. We were going to have to die. And it's not just like our physical death, because we still die physically, right? But it's an eternal death. Because we sin against God, the punishment is eternal. It's everlasting. And so we needed an everlasting, um, we needed a, 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 an, a, an everlasting payment for that to overcome the debt that we owe. Now in Leviticus, it says this. In Leviticus 17, it tells us what atones for our sins. What is it that atones for our sins? This is Leviticus. This is the Torah. 
Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says this. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So this is why you see them in the Old Testament, why they're sacrificing lambs and oxes and goats and things of this nature. They're sacrificing these things to atone for their sins, but though that atonement was temporary. This is why they had to keep doing it. They had to keep on sacrificing lambs and goats and oxes and sheep and things of this nature because those sacrifices were not everlasting. They were only temporary. So, and they were just a shadow of what was to come, that the Messiah would be the ultimate sacrifice, that his sacrifice will be the everlasting sacrifice that finalizes it all. That's why Jesus said on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Then he breathed his last, right? So, <clears throat> so according to the law, we sin, we owe God our life eternally. So why it's necessary that, that we have an eternal savior, God himself, because no creature can do it. No man can do it. No angel had to be God himself. Who's the only one who's powerful enough, whose value is high enough in order to compensate for the sins of all mankind and to redeem the world had to be God himself. So God himself comes, takes on human form, and gives his life as a ransom, an eternal ransom that lasts forever. And now we can walk in the freedom of eternal life in believing in Christ, right? Coming to him as our Lord and Savior, submitting to him. The stain of sin for those who believe is washed away by his blood, by his atonement. Yeah, I, I, I can't honestly deny that that is, you know, honorable and that is like a sign of love mm -hmm. obviously like if the if a mother she would be willing to die for her child exactly you know and it's it, you know it's driven by you know it's an act of love basically yeah. so absolutely yeah that's exactly what it is i mean the bible says so one i showed you the verse where it says for god so loved the world right he loved the world so much that that's what he did here's another verse that says that it says that and he showed his love by this uh What's that verse, guys? He showed his love by this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. <clears throat> yeah, I'm about to use all of you guys. Let me, let me see if I can actually find it myself before anybody is quick enough. Let's see. While we were still sinners. Boom. Yes. Yes, here it is. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I already beat you to it, 100. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, this is what it says. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It says that God loved us even while we were sinners, even in the midst of us sinning. He loved us in that moment that Christ died for us. He didn't have to do it, but he loved us enough that he did. And you see this common theme, right? The common theme throughout the Bible is God's love for mankind and him redeeming mankind back to himself. Buying us back, getting us back. That's the theme throughout the scripture. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that you can do. We can't pray enough, fast enough, you know, give enough to the poor that would be good enough to wipe away our own stain of sin. But God can do it. And he did it. Yeah, it, it, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, the one issue that I had, to, you know, before is um, I was thinking, you know, how can how can this be be real? Because how can God do that? Yeah. But then but then it's like it has a problem with, you know, in the uh, Quran, you know, where God is, you know, he, he's all powerful. So it's like, why couldn't he do that? It's, yeah, it's kind of like, exactly. <laughs> what are we to decide? Oh, man. And yeah. you, you are, 
You're a breath of fresh air right now. You really are. You're a breath of fresh air. You get it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real with you. It sounds like I'm talking to a completely different person than who I started off with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The thing is, um, the thing is, you know, doubts, they are, they are there. They are obviously there. But the thing that was suppressing, you know, you know, everything is questioning is, you know, this, this faith or this blind faith that you said, that is the, that is the, basically the obstacle. So when that is, you know, out of the way, mm -hmm. everything is just comes, you know, like everything is like a flood, you know, yes. there's so many things like, yes, there's no, yes. Yeah. Amen. It's a flood. You're right. The flood of doubts, the flood of questions, and then the scales that are on your eyes begin to fall. And then you can see clearly you're not blind anymore. You can hear clearly now. Your heart is not hardened. Everything is open now. And now you can freely hear the voice of the Spirit of God. You can hear it. You can feel the conviction on your heart. And that's where the freedom is. The freedom is once you finally say, you know what, Lord? Yes. I, you're, you're it. Forgive me for my sins. You're my Lord. Save me from my sins. I submit to you. Free me from this darkness. Bring me into your light. It's that when the freedom of God and the peace of God, the Bible says his peace that surpasses all understanding. It's like, yeah, like what is this? That's when that comes upon you and the spirit fills you up. He gives you the gift of his own spirit, his own presence, fills you up. And you're a new, you're a new, a new woman. And I am a new man. We're new creatures. You know, the Bible literally says that he who is in Christ is a new creature. Matter of fact, this is how Jesus says it. This is this is what Jesus says. He describes it as being born again. Have you heard that concept before? Being born again? Yeah, is 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 that when the people are um when they uh, when they come out the, the water and it's well yeah that's that the, well 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 really it's not really about the bapt that's that's baptism. Being born again is when your spirit is renewed. It's like it's a it's a spiritual transformation. Your old the, you die to your old self, and God creates you anew. You're a new creature spiritually on the inside. And that's what it is. And so Jesus says this. He says, talking to a priest, actually, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? <laughs> can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered him. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So do not be surprised that I said to you, you must be born again. All right. So this is how remember. And, and I told you, remember, we was comparing slaves versus sons of God, slaves of God versus sons of God. And the verse said, and I gave you in John chapter one, it said that whoever received Christ and believed in him, in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, not born of the flesh, not born of blood, not born of the will of man, but born of God. That's what it is. You're being born of God, renewed and adopted into God's family as his daughter. So... Okay, so like, how would one go about if they would want to like get you know connect with with God? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's really simple, sister. Um, I can give you a model, but this is I'll I'll give you what to do. Um, all you have to do is you get alone by yourself, or you can do it here, no matter where you are, and you come to God honestly. You come to God honestly, you come to him boldly, and you say, God, in your words, it has to be from your, it has to be your own words in your own heart. God, 
please forgive me of my sins. I believe in you as your Lord, as the Lord. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who died for my sins. I believe you rose him again for the third day. You confess that he died and he rose again. Right. And you say that you confess this with your mouth. You believe this in your heart and you confess this out loud and say, <clears throat> I am yours. Tell him that you're that you belong to him and tell him that you are inviting him into your life. You do that. You make that confession with your heart. It's true and genuine, with your own words. Instantly, you are connected with God. And the Bible says you're saved. And then, after that, you then begin your walk in Christ. You get a Bible. You begin to read the gospel. Read about Jesus and his teachings. Read about the prophets. Um, and also find a church. Get connected with a church, a good Bible-believing church that's teaching good doctrine, right? Um, get a community and get connected with your church, and um, and God will lead you from there. Okay, so first thing, it's an outward confession. This is what the Bible says here. I just I pulled this from uh, Romans chapter ten says this. It says, um, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Okay. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Okay. So it's an honest, heartfelt confession from yourself, from your own spirit, from your own heart. And you give this outward confession from the heart that you believe in God, that you believe that Jesus is Lord, and that He God raised him from the dead. And you are now adopted into the family of God. You're now a sister in the faith. So do, do you guys, uh, you know, pray, you know, like five times a day or like something rituals or something... Um, Consistently, like every day, like they do in the in Islam. Uh, the, well, <clears throat> really, it's it's more personal. Um, you, there's no ritual ritual prayer, like because prayer in the Bible is supposed to be um, an individual's connection and communication with God. So um, there's no like, oh, you have to pray at this time, or you have to pray at this time, you have to pray at this time. No, you develop your own discipline. And, and with how you want to communicate at any time of the day, right? And so there are some, like my dad, for example, I remember I would see, I would see my dad, he would, uh, he would pray all the time, uh, but he would pray consistently. He would wake up early in the morning, like six in the morning. He'll pray at that time. I'll see him, he'll pray at noon, right? Around the afternoon. And then he'll pray uh, in the evening as we're going to bed. So that's what I saw with my dad. Other people are different. Other people pray more. <laughs> Other people pray at different times or places, you know. Um, but as long as you develop that relationship with God and it's personal with you and him, um, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> That's what matters to God, not the ritual. Okay. So to answer your question, there isn't, you know, maybe there may be some, like, I think it depends on church and culture as well. Like, maybe I think there may be some churches that do have um, ritual prayer times and things of this nature, maybe certain seasons in which they're praying at a certain time and stuff like that. Depends on the church you go to. Uh, but really, churches uh, or prayer is personal for you, right? The Bible says, yes, exactly, guys. The Bible says to pray without ceasing, without stopping, you are to pray. Me, I pray throughout the day. I pray throughout the day, very random times, but I'm always talking to God. So 
can you can you like feel you know the effects of uh, you know like um, being in in this religion? Like, do do you feel like um, you know there's a a difference? I don't know if you have been Christian your whole life. Or Sister, something. absolutely. Now, um, this this is this is. Let me tell you something important about Christianity. It's not about feeling. It's not about what you feel because a lot of times we we're ro humans are roller coasters. You know what I'm saying? There will be times where we're feeling where I'm feeling up and then rejuvenated and encouraged and really glorifying God. There will be days where I'm down and I feel like God's not hearing anything and things aren't going right, and where I don't feel like opening my mouth to give God praise and glory, but I do anyway because He's worthy, even in my bad times, right? Um, but there are those times where I don't feel it, right? I don't feel that thing. But I know that despite what I'm feeling, God is with me and he's faithful and he's always there. He never forsakes me. So it's knowing that. So feelings, is they fluctuate. God doesn't. God is always faithful. Okay? So that's number one. Now, number two, to answer your question more personally... I myself, I am living in an answered prayer for years, <clears throat> for a couple of years, actually. I was uh, not, not too long, but for a couple of years, um, I was homeless. I didn't have a place to call home for a long time. I was hopping from friend's house to friend's house. Um, didn't have a dime to my name. No money, no car, nothing, right? going on for a couple years. And even in that time, I, because of my relationship with God and I know that he's faithful and I continue to read and have my prayer life ready, you know, talking to him constantly. In that time where I was homeless, no money, you know, uh, no place to call home, stuff like that. Grandmother died, dies and things of this nature. Even in that, I still had peace and I still had this, the, this joy because these are fruits of the spirit. It's what the Bible calls fruits of the spirit, peace, joy, patience, love, kindness, happiness, uh, not happiness, excuse me, um, but love and self-control, things of this nature. So even in these hard times, God shows me that he's real and that even in these, these times where I have nothing to be happy about, nothing to be joyful about, where everything I, I should be stressing, I'm not. And I'm genuinely not. Not some false, you know, religious, oh, super spiritual type. No, really, I'm good. I know God got me type of thing. That was, that's been, that was my mindset the entire time for those three years. God got me, right? And every time, every way, my needs were supplied. Food. I didn't go hungry. Somehow, I, I, I can't even remember how, but I, would, I always had food. I didn't have, I'm telling you, I didn't have a dime to my name. I had no money. And I, I had food. Um, I wasn't out on the street. I didn't have a home, but I did have shelter. Um, and then eventually, I was able to get a get a car and with friends allowing me to you know drive around do instacart and stuff like that i was able to get my own car then eventually and then get a job and then um but i knew i wanted to do this i didn't want to work that job i was doing i felt like i was slaving and i said god if you called me to spread your gospel i need you to provide for me i need you to provide because i can't do what you want me to do and do this I want to do I want to spread the gospel and preach the rest of my life. And here I am today. A few years later, I am full-time in ministry, able to preach the gospel, able to meet people like you, able to share my testimony and share what God did for me in my lowest. Even when the feelings wasn't there, there were times where I, I felt like, you know, I'm driving around. I used to do Amazon and I'm just driving and I would have frustrating days. I'll be crying. Seriously. I'll, people, some people, you know, they got, they got the ring uh, doorbell so they can see it on the camera. They probably saw me on the camera with tears in my eyes. 
because I was just frustrated, hot and frustrated. Like, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. God, why do you have me here? Type of thing. But then I would check myself and say, God, you're faithful. Whatever it is that you have for me, I will be content. And because of that, God has elevated me and he's given me everything that I have now. I have my own apartment now. I have this ministry, God Logic Apologetics, that is, that I'm, that's able to support my living. And now I'm able to travel to different little states now and evangelize and share the gospel and the good news of Jesus and spend my time on TikTok and YouTube meeting people like you who need to hear the gospel. I am living in an answered prayer. And it literally gets me every time when I wake up. It's crazy. I, it still feels surreal. It feels crazy. Yeah, it is beautiful. Like you, when you talk about the, yes, you're in, you're in peace and and this love, and but I can speak from my own experience when I say that there's there's like a sense of um, almost uh, stress mm -hmm. because you know that um, it's never you know guaranteed that you will go to heaven. Yep. Is is there's never guaranteed, and yeah. it's like you have to do good deeds every single day. And there will there will be um, a scale in the day of judgment, and they will put your deeds there, and so you never know. So you're in constant like stress, you know. And yeah. It's like fear. It's like, mm -hmm. and there's like oh, there's punishment in the in the grave. There's just you. So you're in constant. You're never at peace. Yeah. That's that's really what it is. So. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and I, and I can tell you, that it's not me. I can I can confidently with surety tell you that it was nothing but God and it's still nothing but God. Nothing that I have now and the peace that I had then and still have now was of my own, not of me. Literally God, the God that I serve. There's not a single person that, could, that can tell me that God isn't real, that my God isn't real. Can't do it. Can't do it. I have firsthand experienced his faithfulness. His faithfulness, you know. He yeah. he didn't yeah. forsake me. So yeah, you trying to get me to cry, but I'm not gonna do it. In it's not gonna happen. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't even answer the question. I just came up. Uh, just <laughs> no, no, so, don't, don't, don't even. Don't even worry about this. What what you came with was much more important. Look at where we got. I this is just to draw people in, you know, the the topics and stuff. It's just to draw people in. But if there's someone that is open to truth, I I I go where God tells me to go. And <clears throat> I think that this was spirit led. You needed this, you know? I needed this. We all need uh, 600 of us in here. 1300 on YouTube. We needed this. Yeah. I don't think I would ever, you know, see these, uh, these hadiths or these, these verses. Mm -hmm. If I didn't come up here, I would never find out. Exactly. exactly. I don't think so. And imagine if, if I was so hell bent on sticking to my subject and just arguing and debating, I would not have been able, had the chance to, to show you that. Right. Like, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. I care about those who, want the truth and winning souls to Christ. That's my purpose here. Not to debate, not to debate, but to show the light of Christ. And that's it. That's it. So sister, tell me what you're thinking. What are you thinking? What are you thinking about Jesus? I want to know. Tell me, give me the, give me the tea. So the, the 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 thing is that um, the verse that I provided first, that saying that the the Quran is unique, and it, and it can't be nothing. No one else can like, you know, produce anything like it. Mm -hmm. But then there's this hadith where Omar is, you know, it shows that that is not correct. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, it's it's not the hadith I, I can reject because. I am Sunni. Yeah. It's Sahih. Yeah. So 
then it, then if we say that the that that by that the Quran is false, then we look at the the scriptures, and then it's like by default you have to believe that Jesus is God. Yes. That's kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And that's how he presents himself. By default. That's what Jesus says. Let me show you. And I don't think that it's yourself that took this. This is God speaking to you, sister, and convicting you into believing, into showing into this, into knowing this. This is what Jesus says. He says, <clears throat> I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and, the, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And he goes on to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. You hear what Jesus is saying? I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. By default, Scriptures is clear, right, about the divinity of Jesus, about his relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is why, let me just wrap this, this, just this concept up with Jesus here. He says in Matthew, says in Matthew in the last chapter, Matthew 20, 28. He says this, Matthew chapter 28, this is verse 16. It says, now the 11 disciples, this is after his resurrection. Now the, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, one name, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Jesus is clear. The gospel is clear of who Jesus is, right? Who our God is, the triune God, unlike anything in creation. You can't compare him to no one. We are to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus says he and the Father are one, along with the Holy Spirit. And he says, we confess that he's Lord and that he raised from the dead. You are saved. Do you believe him, sister? That's why I ask you. Do you believe him? Believe? What do you mean? Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Yeah, I have to say, considering everything, um, and the evidence, and because I believe in the in the in the scriptures that the previous ones, then I have to I have to say yes, yes. And do you believe that God raised him from the dead for our sins, as the scriptures have said? Yeah, yes, I do. Then you're saved, sister. Welcome to the family of Christ. Yeah, thank well, you. Thank you. Welcome to the family of Christ. You have now entered into new life. Um, and when you get home, you know, or well, you are probably already home. It's probably late. But in your time, in your alone time, 
send up a prayer to God, send up a prayer to Christ and tell him to guide you, that you want him to guide you, that you want him to lead you, that you want to know him intimately. Tell him these things, express them freely yourself. Talk to him like you're talking to a friend. That's how he invites you. He says he no longer calls us servants, but he calls us friends, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. You have now entered new life and you are a new creature, sister. Glory to God. The angels are rejoicing over you. They rejoice over you, sister. The comment section, our brothers, you have a family of thousands of believers rejoicing over yeah. you. Everyone's really nice uh, in the comments. In the comments. <laughs> Amen. But obviously some uh, Muslims, they are not so happy. Of course not. Of course not. But I'll say this, sister, because um, I want you to beware. I want you to beware. You're going to be attacked. You're going to be, especially on this app, it's very it's, it's very hostile. The Bible talks about actually, um, guys, what's that, what's that verse really quick, guys, about the, uh, the one who hears the word, but strong winds comes or uh, you know satan comes and sweeps the word from him takes the word what's what's that verse guys that where, where jesus talks about that really quick i'm going to show you this because i want you to be prepared for what you're going to see because the bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood right humans are not our enemies humans are not our enemies it's the spirits and the principalities that are behind these enemies, behind these false teachers that are against us. It's not the humans, it's not them, right? So this is spiritual warfare, Matthew 13. Thank you guys. This is spiritual warfare. So I want you to understand and be girded up and be ready um, for the attacks that's gonna, that will come your way because you are a new, you're a new believer in Christ. <clears throat> So uh, I believe it's Matthew 13, guys. Uh, 23. Okay, got it. Thanks, guys. Okay, so watch this. It says, so Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, it says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. See that? So even when it's something that's difficult to understand, the enemy, the devil, tries to come and snatch the word that has been sown into your heart. He then says, this is what, is, this is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, because of the word that he heard, the gospel, the truth, the revelation, immediately he falls away. So when this person, he accepts the word with, with cheerfulness, with excitement, with joy, right? But we have an enemy. We have Satan. We have demons out there. They, they want us to disbelieve. And it says here that this person receives the word, immediately rejoices, right? But tribulations and persecution comes and this person falls away. Okay? So... I just want you to be aware of that. He said, and he, he continues, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for the one who, as for the, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another case 60, and in another 30. So when the word is sown in good soil, you want to be the good soil. You hear it, you have understood it, and then now you produce its fruits. You hear the word of God, the word of Jesus, you perform it, 
You do what he commanded and you show that it's fruitful with you. Don't be like the one who hears the word, received it gladly, but through persecution and tribulation fell away. Don't be like, don't be that. Don't be the rocky ground. Don't be the thorns. Be the good soil. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to keep that in mind. Because mm -hmm. I know the reaction might not be so so good Absolutely. on the other side. Absolutely. So. so, sister, I'm following you now. So you can message me. Um, and if you ever have questions, you can hit me up directly. Um, I can also um, <clears throat> give you brothers and sisters to follow. Um, just really quick. Hold on. Christian Table Talk, can you come up? This is uh, her. This is Sister Diane. She's beautiful. Um, also, Black Doctor Chris Claus, come on up, guys. Coming up. So these are these are my brothers who help me. They help teach me a lot of things and things of this nature. We're very close knit. I want you to follow them. Uh, follow these accounts. Um, they are so strong in the faith, so good in the word. And they can answer so many questions. Black Doctor, Chris Claus are so good. Christian Table Talk here. This is a sister, Sister Diane. Say hi, sister. Hi, sister. God bless you. I'm so happy. Hi, you guys. Hi. Um, I have followed you. So if you ever want to message me or if you ever have questions, you can always uh, do that. We are here for you, sister. So uh, yeah, don't worry about anything. Yep. Yes, thank you guys. I think uh, it's a it's a, it's a nice community. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Sister Diane here, or or Christian Table Talk. Sorry, I'm saying your name. Uh, she's the boss. She's the one who we 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 fear her. She's the boss. So, she she runs all of it. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, stay connected with us. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, any of all of us, we're willing, we will spend time with you, get on the phone with you, um, connect you with other people with, you know, just a community. Cause it's a big, it's a, it's a beautiful community that we have and we help each other. We share sources and everything. So, um, yes, I just want you to be connected with us. Okay. Um, but yeah, so with that, we're all following you now, black Dr. Chris, you guys want to say anything about you guys up for a reason? Right. I, I I'd like to say uh, th this has been an amazing live stream. Um, yeah. I actually shed a tear earlier. God bless both of you. Um, it's just an amazing thing to see. And again, sister, any questions that you do have, uh, Avery Logic was right. Um, you can hit us up day or night. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if it's a question that you think is minuscule or not. We won't we won't take it as a minuscule question. We will give you the answer that you're looking for. We won't try to push anything on you. We will allow you to come to us and ask those questions. So again, God bless you. And again, God bless you as well, Avery. Amen. And uh, si sister, I <laughs> the scriptures say that the angels rejoice when a sinner repents and turns to Christ. And not only do the angels rejoice, but we saints rejoice. I have been leaping around <laughs> because of the testimony that you've given and what God has done in this live stream. A sister, just as Avery said, we are elated for you. We are so excited for you. But we also know that the enemy is going to come at you like a flood. So we are going to surround you. We are going to make sure that you're okay. And so any questions that you have, we are here for you. And, and with, with Christianity, there's, there's no such thing as a stupid question. No such thing. So we're going to, we, we will either have the questions answered for you, or we can find people who do. <laughs> because... I, I love the, the, the big difference from the way that you began this conversation to the way that it is now. Islam is not allowing you, would not allow you to ask questions. 
but Christianity does because we believe that the same God who knows all things is the very one who is able to answer the questions of his people. So if you need anything, anything at all, any questions come to us and we will be able to help you. I promise you. Yes. Um, Amen. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, it's just uh, it's just nice to 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 have to been presented with the uh, you know hadiths and and verses and stuff like that. Um, things that I maybe didn't know before. Hmm. So it's it's an eye opener for sure. And uh, to compare, you know, the God nature of uh, Jesus compared to what I've been used to. So. It's so just I just appreciate that I'm here and I got the chance to amen. be present today. Amen, amen. So amen. Thank you guys. Amen. That's so awesome. Can I leave off with some words here, Avery? Of course, of course, man. And Paul's up here too. Also, sister, follow Paul Bishop right here. He's also part of a, a, a intricate part in our ministry as well. He speaks Arabic too and knows that he's he's so good, man. He he's really good. So I encourage you to follow this brother as well. He breaks down the Arabic and everything like of this nature. And I can't wait to hear what Paul has to say too. But yeah, go ahead, Chris. Well, just a few seconds. In Kings chapter 856, we read, Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people or Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all good promises that he gave through his servant Moses. The record of God's promises therein is his word for we all, for uh, all of us to see. As it, as it is recorded of their fulfillment, historical documents verify those events and speak of God's faithfulness, faithfulness to his people. Every Christian, even you, sister, can give a personal 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 testimony to God's trustworthiness as he as we see his work in our lives mm. fulfilling his promises to save our souls and use us for his purposes and comfort us with the peace that passes all understanding as we run the race as he planned out for us the more we experience his grace faithfulness and goodness the more we trust in him and i would just implore you sister just trust in him amen 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 paul how you doing brother uh, god bless you all i'm i'm ecstatic to start with and um uh, <laughs> i i couldn't see this turn around only you avery could possibly have this center around it's, uh, god have used you and blessed you with a gift that uh, i i like for 100 percent sure because i'm more confrontational than than this and um hmm. uh, god bless the sister for being receptive and being honest that that is a very rare thing to see online like it is absolutely rare to see online so all the blessings and all glory to god but that we were blessed to have you too, sister. So seriously, the the only thing that I have to notify you is, the, um, you're gonna be under attack constantly, like a lot. So you have to build a fort, like a fortress around you, where you could have us answer the questions or have us deal with those objections because they're going to start making things up about Christianity that that would make you run away from Christianity. Just like you thought there is only a few hadith that would actually uh, debunk Islam. No, there's hundreds of hundreds of arguments against Islam that we can present that Muslims don't have answers to. We have answers for everything. Everything that we could possibly uh, like answer within our limited knowledge as human beings, we have answers. Muslims, we have hundreds of arguments where the answer is Allahu Alam. Allahu Alam. I have no idea. We have even Shiyukh that would come and would say Allahu Alam. 
I have witnessed these things many, many times over. So, <clears throat> and, and just with all that being said, it's just you gotta try to be cautious in the next few days. If anything, try to not come to any lives. Mm-hmm. If anything, try to just DM one of us or DM uh, others. And if, if, if it comes down to it, we will go to the court for you. If, if it comes down to it, if you think that the Muslim that I have reached to you convince you that it's not, uh, Christianity is, is false because of an argument, we're more than happy to go and debate that argument for you. Like, this is not a question. We're more than happy to debate any argument that these guys will have, any objection. No. All right, so very good good words of wisdom from the brothers and sisters. Um, Sig, you got something you want to say before I leave? About to close this down. No, I just want to say again, uh, thank you for for having me here, and uh, that you you have been very like willing to answer everything. Absolutely. Um, so, and in, 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 as it has been in a way that is it wasn't been like in an attacking way. It was in a very inviting, you know, manner. You know, mm-hmm. so. I just want to be say thank you for that. Praise God, glory to God. Yeah, like 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 what they said, like what Paul said. You blessed us today. Um, uh, Chris said, "You guys, you you blessed me today." So, you you understand. I do this all the time, sis. I do this all the time, and the amount of frustrating characters that I get, <laughs> like Paul was saying, he was like, "Dude, only you could do this or whatever." Like in this in this conversation or whatever. The, the characters that we get are a lot a lot of times unbearable. They're like, Avery, how do you talk to these people? How do you do it? Keep doing it. Just keep on going, man. Um, but I'm glad that you came and it was a breath of fresh air, honestly. So thank you for coming. And I praise God. I thank God, the holy God, the good God, just magnificent God for revealing himself to you, for drawing you here to this live so that you can get the truth and you was ready for it. Um, man. I, I it's I can't wait for you to look back at this conversation in the beginning, like literally in in the beginning, you were different, completely different. You know what I'm saying? And so the, the transformation happened in the conversation. <laughs> so um, let me just do this prayer here. Um, I pray that God protects you. I pray that God lifts you up. I pray that he girds his angels around you that he um, holds you in the palm of his hand. I pray that his word stays with you, that um, you do not get swayed by any wave or false teaching or philosophy that comes out that tries to raise itself above Christ. I pray that he gives you the power, the discernment and the wisdom to be able to cast down every lie and falsehood that comes your way as a new believer. I pray this in Jesus' name. Christ is with you. He loves you. He empowers you. Okay? And you are victorious now because God has already won the battle. You're victorious now. So I praise God for this victory. I praise God for you. I thank God for you. All right, guys. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, maybe for the, for the Muslim chat. I, I know for, for a fact that people sister, they are really afraid to share their, their doubts. And uh, you are very brave that you came on stage and actually shared it with us. And uh, if, if there are any Muslims in the chat who have maybe the same problems, you guys can always message us and uh, you don't have to do it in public. Maybe yeah, if you have questions or you can always come to us. Uh, yeah, that's mm-hmm. what I to say also. Because I know for a fact there are many that the, the guys... The ones that are working you now, there, there are many of them, they, they have the same problems. So, uh, yeah, you, you are very cur- you, you had very much courage today. And, uh, yeah, we love you very much, sister. And, uh, yeah, please message us any day of the hour. You cannot message us always. We are always there for you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Amen. You mind yes. if I pray it's not Avery? Go ahead, brother. 
All right, let us pray. Oh, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have made our hearts full. You, <laughs> through the words of your servant, Augustine, you said you have made us for ourselves, for yourself. And our hearts are restless until we find rest in you. And Lord, you showed it. <laughs> you showed it today. Amen. We thank you for your, your new servant and who you brought out of darkness into the marvelous light of your gospel. We bless you. We praise you. We give you thanks. You have been our sanctuary, and therefore you have brought sanctuary to this, to this young woman. Yes, Lord. Father, we ask that you who saved her, strengthen her, fill her with the Holy Spirit, seal her until the day of redemption. Let her await the waters of baptism where she receives your promise once again that just as she's washed with water, she is saved forever. Amen. Father, protect us. As we seek to obey your command, we thank you for Sig. We thank you for Diane. We thank you for Chris. We thank you for Avery, your servant who brought, whom you brought to us. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you for the power that you have bestowed within him. For we know that he could not do it on his own, but it is only by your power. Yes, Lord. Father, we ask that you empower us as well to do your will. And as we separate today, Lord, do not leave us. Give us grace so that we might preach to the nations just as we preach here. That there is a God in Israel who loves the nations and who gave himself for us. We ask this in Christ's name who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one almighty and eternal triune God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Good night, everybody. I love you. Good night, Ann. I love you, too, as my new sister in Christ. Thank you for coming. Thank you all, everybody, for coming up and sharing words and um, making yourself available to the new sister. Um, and for you guys watching, thank you guys for sticking with us this long. We're almost, we've been live for almost four hours now, and we see why it was worth it. So you guys take care of yourselves. TikTok, good night. And like I said, if you have anything, just hit me up. I'm right here. So good night to everybody. I love each and every one of you. Be blessed. Walk in God's favor. Walk in the spirit and shine his light wherever you are. Work, school, whatever it is. Okay. Peace. Take care. Yes. Wow. What can you say? What can you say? My sheep hear my voice, exactly. What can you say? I was only supposed to be doing this for two hours, guys. I was only supposed to be doing this for two hours. And bless, blessed be the name of the Lord that, um, you know, I don't know. I just thank God, man. He led the entire conversation. He led the entire conversation and he worked on her. He worked on her heart and he worked on her mind the entire time. Yes, I do this all the time. Yes, I do this all the time. So, all right, I want to say good night to, to the rest of you guys. Um, man, my, my spirit is rich right now. <laughs> All right, good night, guys.